Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You are a good looking bunch. I declare you are. Well, <laughs> most of you anyway. <laughs> Sue and I are glad to be here. She's right back there. I'll have her raise her hand because if it weren't for her, I wouldn't be here anywhere. And uh, we were here several years ago. You may not remember that, but it's good to be back here today. I appreciate Chris inviting me. And if I don't do too much damage here this morning, I'll be back in about three weeks if you let me come back in about three weeks. I was walking around your facility a while ago inside, and man, this, this place is immaculate. Who's responsible for all of that? I'm impressed with all and, I, and the pastor's study, you are? All right. Oh, Lord, okay. Uh, the pastor's study is, is great, and, and uh, your very intimate prayer room is, is wonderful, and your fellowship center. I kind of looked over here, and I saw a pretty good-sized trash receptacle, or trash can, I guess, with an Auburn um, insignia on it. Did I? That's okay. That's okay because they are tigers. But I looked next to it and just for a second my heart rate increased because it said Gamecocks. But then it said Jacksonville. That's okay. I love the Jacksonville Gamecocks. The reason Gamecocks cause my heart rate to go up is because the school of which I am an alumnus is the biggest rival to those Gamecocks. And if you don't run me off, I'll just tell you I'm an alumnus of Clemson University. It's great to be here with you. And uh, if you have an Old Testament handy, let's look to the uh, 53rd chapter of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53. Help this here it is. Verses 4 through 6. Isaiah the prophet who preached to royalty and ordinary people alike. Isaiah, who has some very famous uh, words to us, such as, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. There is another one which says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who have dwelled in the land of the shadow of death, upon them has the light shined. They who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not be weary, and they will walk and not faint. And so today the text is what is called the Suffering Servant Passage or the Suffering Servant Song. And this is what Isaiah says beginning in verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we're healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, or of all of us. What's going on here? Who is the suffering servant? We know from a study of Isaiah and the history of Israel that in about 587 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, invaded Jerusalem and ransacked the city and carried most of the inhabitants of Jerusalem and Judah into captivity and held them there for, oh, approximately 70 years. At about this time in the history and the ministry of Isaiah, King Cyrus of Persia has defeated Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, and he is about to issue an edict allowing all of those hostages to come back home. In fact, the Old Testament books of, of Ezra and Nehemiah are set against that background. And that verse I quoted a minute ago, the people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them is the light shine. That was the original context of that verse. But we see it fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. I think in this time, in this context of Isaiah, that he is referring to the people of Israel, the good people of the nation of Israel, the suffering servant. They had suffered much as a servant of the Lord, and they would suffer much, much more. But my friends, we live on this side of the cross. We live on this side of the empty tomb. And we see the suffering servant being fulfilled in the life, the person, the death, the ministry, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is the suffering servant. 
But somebody might say, but God does not suffer pain, does he? He alleviates it. A Messiah does not suffer. He conquers. But this Messiah conquered through his sufferings. And the New Testament writers give confirmation to that. The earliest New Testament confirmation of Jesus as the suffering servant is in the book of Acts when Luke reminds us of Philip and his encounter with that Ethiopian eunuch who was sitting in his chariot reading this very text from the scroll of Isaiah. And he was confused as to whom it was referring. And so Philip, you know, joins with him in that chariot and explains it to him and explains to him it is referring to Jesus. And that Ethiopian accepted him and was baptized right then. And Simon Peter refers to it in one of his books. And, and uh, Paul refers to it in Romans, and so does John and Matthew. And Luke kind of refers to this idea at the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. He is the suffering servant. But let's look at this just a little closer and see if we can take this text and with the Lord's help, apply it to ourselves today. I want you to go back to verse 1, which I did not read a while ago, but verse 1, Isaiah 53, 1. Who has believed our report? Can you believe it? That's what he's saying. Can you believe this? This was way before the time of Ripley and believe it or not. But Isaiah was saying, believe it or not, this is what the Messiah, the suffering servant has done. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Well, you don't live long until you experience some grief and some sorrow. That's a part of life. Grief is our natural response to any significant loss. Nowhere does the Bible say, do not grieve. It says, as, as Paul said to the Thessalonians, brethren, let us not grieve as those who have no hope. Jesus grieved. Jesus identifies. He wept. He cried. He knew sorrow and grief. He identifies with us. He became one of us so that by faith we could become one of His. And sometimes I think through the years that it takes just as much or more faith to trust Him through grief and sorrow as it does to expect a miracle. Because grief comes. Sorrows. We have sorrows. He's called in some place a man of sorrows. And I would think that in most churches, in every church, in fact, on any given Sunday morning, in almost every row, in almost every pew, there is at least some sort of sorrow or some sort of grief or some sort of burden. He has carried, He carries with us our griefs and our sorrows. And just when we think we can never be happy again, that all of a sudden the message and the hope of Easter breaks in upon us with the hope of the love of God, even if it were midwinter. Grief and sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was pained, that's what it means. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised, pained, hurt for our iniquities. Now what's transgression? Transgression is an Old Testament word for sin, which means to cross the line to break a rule, to break a commandment. When I was a little boy, my sister used to aggravate me to death. I mean, she worried me to death. She was always in everything I had. She would always mess with my model cars. And one day I was outside and I saw her through the window of my room, had her hands down in those cars. And this was in my secular days, I guess. I had a baby gun with me. And I caught that baby, that air rifle, and I shot at her right through my own window in my own room right toward her because she was aggravating me because she was getting into my automobiles, my cars. And one day I was out playing with my bow and arrow. You know, the kind that you pull it back a little bit with a little rubber tip on the end of it. And I was out there and she comes up and she just gets in the way. I said, if you don't move, I'm going to shoot you with this arrow. She just looked at me, and she kind of grinned. Her, her lip kind of like an Elvis look like this, you know, and just said, so what? Well, what was I going to do? She had transgressed. 
I didn't know that word. I didn't know there was such a word. I know she had stepped. She, I drew a line in the sand. I said, you step across this line, I'm going to shoot you with this arrow. She just does this. She just steps across that line. Have any of you ever had, remember a little sister who worried you like that or who is worrying you or maybe, you know, an older brother or something like that? So I decided to show her some grace. I did not know what grace was. I'd never heard that word grace, but I gave her a second chance. That's sort of what grace is. God gives us a second chance. And I stepped back and I drew another line in the sand and I said, that's it. You cross this line, I'm going to shoot you with this arrow. Lo and behold, she just looks at me and just steps across it and stands there like, well, my integrity was on the line and I pulled back that little, don't you guys do that, okay? I pulled back that little bow, not all the way. I really didn't want to damage her too bad. Oh, and I had taken off, I had taken off that little rubber tip <laughs> and I had put in an old dusty nail. I declare it's the truth. And I pulled back and I let that thing go and it hit her right here in the forehead and I, and I saw the blood gush out and she runs in, mama, mama. I said, I told you there are consequences to transgressions, to stepping across the line. <laughs> Pretty soon after that, I learned that there are consequences to transgressions. <laughs> I promise you that. Iniquities. He was bruised for our iniquities. Iniquity is also an Old Testament term or sin, which means wickedness, evil, immorality. It also, in the original language, contains the idea of being crooked, crookedness, spiritually crooked before God and His holiness and His righteousness. But we are made straight. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. And then he goes on and talks about by his stripes. That's what the King James or the new King James at least. And by his, his punishment, by, by his, his sufferings, we have peace with stripes. By his stripes we're healed. You remember the gospel writers talking about Jesus' uh, sufferings and his crucifixion. And just before that, how they beat him so. It's called scourging. And they would just rip with their whips, just rip one's back just in shreds. Looking ahead about maybe 700 years after this, this text, that's what occurred. But then here comes one of my favorite sections. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, who? Christ, the iniquity, the wickedness, the sinfulness, the crookedness, the transgressions of us all. There is a sheep farm Oh, a mile or two from where I live, and I know the owner. And I called him up one day in, in light of this text, and I said, what, uh, tell me about sheep. He said, they are skittish. They are nervous. They need protection. They need guidance. The little ones especially will run off in all kinds of directions with no direction, and sometimes they can't get back. Or maybe some, some larger animal will destroy them. And so Isaiah knows what he's saying. All we like sheep have gone astray. And the Lord's laid on him the iniquity of us all, or of all of us. An old preacher was preaching one Sunday night in a little church. And there were a couple of teenage boys or so sitting in the back. By the way, now that I'm retired after 27 years at First Baptist Fort Payne, we still attend there, but I sit in the back. <laughs> And it's an interesting section back in there. But anyway, they were sitting back there that Sunday night. They weren't paying any attention until that old preacher started to tell this story. He told about a father and his son who were Christians and his son's friend who was not a believer at that time and how they had gone out fishing in the ocean in a rather moderate-sized boat and a tremendous storm came and a tremendous wave just washed over that boat and washed all three of them into the sea. And the father struggled back and, and he made it back safely into the boat and he turned around to rescue his son and his son's friend. But he discovered he had only one lifeline. And so he called out to his son, looked to his face, said, Son, I love you, son. And he threw it out to his son's friend. 
And by the time he, 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 he got him safely on board, his son had gone down for the third time and his body was never recovered. Well, after church that night, those boys came up and they, they talked to the preacher and they said, Sir, we just can't believe that. We just don't think that's true. How could a father sacrifice his own son? How could he not rescue his own son first? And that old preacher said, well, you're right. I don't know how. I can't understand it. I cannot fathom it. But then he said, I was that son's friend. Are you a friend of the son? What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. And so the suffering servant did not just bear the consequences of our transgressions, our iniquities, our sins, our disobedience. The scripture says he was made sin for us. He who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so, because of that, here comes, I think is my last sentence, or very close to my last sentence. Every saint has a past. Every saint has a past. That's us. And every Sinner has a future. Every sinner has a future because of the suffering servant. Would you pray with me, please? Eternal God, our Father, we cannot fathom what it would be like to sacrifice a son or a daughter or a child. But because you sacrificed your son, we have hope, we have life, we have eternal promise this day. Thank you for this congregation of this body of believers. Would you strengthen them and encourage them and bless their pastor as he's away? And right now, if there's one who feels the prodding of your spirit for a recommitment of life, a rededication of trust to follow you or to trust Christ for the first time, we pray for freedom to that spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.